everyone. Welcome to this webinar on ASH 2023 Myeloman A amyloidosis highlights. And this is a webinar organized by Myeloma Patients Europe, and we're really happy to have you there. I'm Solène Clavreul, and uh, I will be the moderator of this webinar. We uh, will start the please. Thank you. Um, so we will start with a short introduction and housekeeping rules. Then um, our speaker, Dr. Faith Davies, will present her myeloma and alamyloidosis highlights from ASH 2023. Then we will continue with a question and answer session before closing the webinar at 6 p.m. Next slide. Um, so first, I would like to give a short reminder of, on how to use the Zoom webinar app. Attendees are not seen or heard uh, in the webinar, so you should be able to see and hear the presenters, but you will not be able to see or hear other attendees, uh, and they will not be able to see or hear you. Um, if you cannot hear the presenters, uh, make sure your speakers are not muted and that the volume is set high. You can use the question and answer um, feature to uh, which is found on the toolbar at the bottom of the window um, to ask questions and please use this feature um, to um, ask a question to the presenter during the Q&A session. You can click on the like button to upvote a question and let us know what questions are of high interest to you uh, and which one we should prioritize during the Q&A session. Don't wait until the end to ask your questions as we will try to group them uh, by topic while the presentation is ongoing. You can use the chat feature to chat with other participants, share your experiences or comments uh, on the current discussion. And um, consider audio only uh, if you are having any troubles with poor video or if the signal is cutting in or out. Um, so in that case, you can consider attending in audio mode and by bypassing the video. If you are experiencing any technical issue, please let us know about it uh, using the chat and uh, one of my colleagues uh, will try to assist you. Do not use the chat to ask questions to the presenters, but use the Q&A um, function for that purpose. If you don't see the toolbar at the bottom or at the top uh, of the Zoom window, just move your mouse slightly and the bar should appear. And the bar will disappear after a few seconds uh, when um, you're using the full screen mode. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website, www.mpeurope.org and uh, through our usual social and media channels. At the end of the webinar, um, please help us improve our future events and share your thoughts um, via a 30 second survey um, that we will share with you during the webinar. The link will be posted on the chat. Um, then we would also like to better understand your motivations to attend the webinar. So please answer this short poll. Your response is of course anonymous can uh, choose all of the that apply if you are here to hear about new developments in myeloma treatments or if you are here to uh, hear about new developments in AL amyloidosis treatments or to ask questions about myeloma and its treatments in general um, or about AL amyloidosis um, and its treatment in general or if you want to ask questions regarding your own medical conditions or if you have any other reasons to be there. Um, so I will leave a little bit of time for you to answer um, and um, we'll have a insight on why you're here and uh, also to better um, set the agenda for future webinars. It seems that everyone, it's, it seems that half of the audience has answered the poll, so we will wait a little bit longer. So far, most of you are here to hear about new developments in myeloma treatments. Um, so I think we can now end the poll. I hope everyone got the opportunity to answer and share the results with the audience. Great, thanks so much.
Um, and just um, one last thing regarding um, that poll, the webinar itself is intended to provide information on um, and discuss about clinical research results that have been presented at ASH, not to provide any personalized medical advice. So please consider this when you're asking your questions. Um, so now we will speak about ASH. Uh, next slide, please. So ASH is, um, stands for American Society of Hematology. It's a professional organization representing hematologists. It's been funded in the late 50s and its annual meeting is held every year and attracts more than 30,000 attendees. It's a four-day meetings with several educational programs, lectures, symposia, and scientific sessions. And the meeting also features oral and uh, poster presentations that contains uh, develop new developments in scientific research. The 2023 annual Congress was um, the 65th one, and it was held last December in San Diego in the United States. We have organized this webinar to uh, share with you the highlights of the conference so you can ask questions related to the latest results in the myeloma and amyloidosis field. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome our speaker of the day, Dr. Faith um, Davis. Next slide, please. She's Director of Clinical Myeloma Programs at the NYU Langone Health Permuter Cancer Center in New York in the United States. She's a hematologist, oncologist, and a a researcher. She has a strong expertise in clinical research and a deep knowledge in the field of myeloma and other blood cancer. She has focused on the biology and treatment of myeloma for several decades, and her work has played a key role in the approval of different um, hematology drugs. Her research work has been published in multiple scientific papers and top journals in the field, and she's also part of the IMWG, the International Myeloma Working Group, which is a very prestigious organization establishing diagnosis and treatment guidelines for myeloma and publishing clinical practice recommendations of for the management of the disease. So thank you so much, Faith, for being there today and for dedicating some of your precious time to MP. The floor is now yours. That's lovely. Thank you so much. And um, good evening, everybody. So the observant amongst you will realize I have a British accent. And so prior to moving to the US, I was um, practicing in um, London. So I'm very um, familiar with um, both the European side of things as well as the um, American side of things. So let's see if we can move the slides. Um, I've kind of divided my highlights into a number of um, different groups. Um, and the first area I wanted to start off with was for newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And um, essentially, the, the big question that's surrounding newly diagnosed um, myeloma patients was really this year for those patients that are, um, are eligible for a transplant. And should we be using anti-CD38 antibodies as part of their regimen? And so those are the antibodies such as daratumumab and isotuximab. Before I get into that, I just wanted to mention a couple of things, because as I go through this, I'll be talking about different kinds of clinical studies, and I thought it was maybe important to get us all on the same page to begin with. When we're doing clinical studies, we talk about them in phases, and there's actually three phases of clinical studies. Um, needless to say, I've forgotten the first day, um, phase on this slide, but the first phase is when we're really testing a new drug. And for that, that study, it's usually tested in patients who've received lots of myeloma therapy before, because we're not quite sure whether the drug will work. And we tend to look at that in just a small number of patients to see if the drug is effective the side effects. We then go on to what we call phase two studies, is where we use the drug in a bigger group of patients. We really determine exactly how effective the drug is and how safe it is. And then the final lot of um, studies we do are called phase three studies. And that's where we do a randomized study. So patients will um, 
get um, a computer will decide which treatment the patient gets. And the idea here is to determine whether one drug is better than another. And usually for drugs to get a approval, they have to go through all of those different phases of the, the studies. And then the results are looked at by the European medical um, establishment to determine whether the, um, that drug is appropriate for um, European patients. And so a number of the different studies I'm going to talk about today are at those different kind of levels of where the, the studies are. And so the first ones I want to talk about are these studies for newly diagnosed patients where we're looking to see if we can improve on the current standard um, at treatment for these patients. Now, for patients that are maybe a little bit older or who are not or heading towards a transplant, we've already discovered that having one of these monoclonal antibodies in their um, treatment is a good thing. And so many patients will have the combination of daratumumab with lenalidomide, sometimes called revlimid, and dexamethasone. But for newly diagnosed patients who are heading towards a transplant, there's been lots of discussion and debate about whether we should be adding those treatments in for these patients as well. Um, and I think the key here is at the moment, potentially depending where in Europe you are, the usual treatment for patients heading towards a transplant might be um, bortezomib or Velcade with thalidomide and dexamethasone or indeed bortezomib, Velcade with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone or potentially bortezomib or Velcade with lenalidomide or revlimid and dexamethasone. And in the US, a study has previously shown that adding daratumumab into this combination um, was um, very effective. But in order to be able to do that in Europe, we need to have that phase three study to show that the combination of daratumumab with the bortezomib, the lenalidomide and dexamethasone is better than the combination of just the three drugs on their own. Now, for um, our listeners in France, they've already taken part in a study um, that was called Cassiopeia that looked at their combination with thalidomide. But the data that got presented at this year's ASH was looking at the, the, the drugs with lenalidomide. And this um, particular paper caused a lot of stir and was one of the um, main papers in what we call the is where the results have just cut hot off the press. So um, all of our studies get named um, um, with different names. So this study is called Perseus, and it's um, a European study run in many um, of the um, European countries. And as I say, essentially what the aim was, was to compare our kind of standard three drugs against the four drugs. And so patients were able to have the daratumumab in kind of all the different portions of therapy that they um, may require. So prior to their transplant, potentially as a consolidation after their transplant, and then um, during their maintenance therapy. And um, Professor Sonnevelt was able to present this data. And essentially, it was a very large study. So we've got um, uh, over 300 patients in the, the two arms. Um, and these patients are very, very typical of newly diagnosed um, myeloma patients. So some of them did have some um, myeloma outside of the bones. Um, and some of them also had what we call these high-risk cytogenetic features these features that might suggest that patients potentially do worse with therapy. And the kind of key results of this was that for patients who had the four drugs, so they had that anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody added in, those patients had a much better response. But not only did more patients have a better response, the actual responses were much, much deeper. And we're going to come to this concept of MRD or minimal residual disease shortly. But essentially, as I say, patients who had the four drugs had a better response. And importantly, those patients had a, um, an improvement in the time without having any disease. And then I, 
The, these are what we call survival curves, and this is a measure of how long the patient stays without disease. Um, and you can see that here we're looking at up to 48 months. Um, and at this time point, you can see that more patients have um, a disease free with the four drug combination. Um, and I think one of the other important things just to note for generally for patients is that over the years, particularly the last five or 10 years, the number of patients, regardless of their induction treatment, that are being disease free at four or five years is actually increasing, which is a great thing for patients. Importantly, we always want to know that, okay, it looks it looks better, but what about the side effects? And the side effects seemed pretty similar between the two groups, and they were very much the ones which are typical for patients. So low blood counts, be that their white cells or their platelets, or infections and temperatures. I did just want to mention a quick note just as we're going through this. Unfortunately, a few patients did die from COVID-19, which, um, and it happened equally in the two arms. So it's obviously an issue that myeloma patients are pretty, particularly prone to. And I just wanted to encourage everybody at this point to go and get their updated vaccine because COVID is still an issue all around the world. And the best thing we can try and do to protect ourselves is by using the vaccination. So anyway, back to this particular study. So essentially what the data suggested was that the four drugs are probably better than the three drugs when we use it for induction. And that actually moving forward, maybe rather than just having patients on lenalidomide or Revlimid maintenance, we maybe need to think about using the two drugs. So the daratumumab and the lenalidomide. So this caused all sorts of um, stir because it could potentially be a big step forward. But obviously, before this can um, be used routinely, we need these drugs to pass through all of the different regulatory authorities. Um, and so there's going to be lots of discussion about the benefits versus the costs and so on. Just along those lines, there was a second study that was presented using a slightly different combination, but with the idea being very similar. And this one actually had one of the plenary sessions at ASH. So that was essentially, it was one of the very top um, abstracts that were presented. Now, I mentioned minimal residual disease a little bit earlier. Um, and if you the way we think about this is when we measure patients' blood in the clinic, we can measure their M component or their paraprotein, and that's the bit we can see easily. But we know that even when we do treatment, patients have a lot or potentially a lot of disease that we just can't see. And we often call this the iceberg effect in the fact that patients have a lot of disease that we can't see. And so when we're measuring this, we think about this as being what we call minimal residual disease, i.e. disease that we can't see, but that we can measure with very, very sensitive tests. And we can measure this down to being able to find one myeloma cell in um, a million, okay, or one myeloma cell in 100,000. So very, very sensitive. And the reason this um, study was so interesting was that rather than using our traditional way of assessing how good a drug is, that is looking at response rate or looking at the time patients have been disease free, what this study used was a measure of how deep the responses were. And this is really key for us, because if you think back to the last slide, with that, with that new combination, at four years, many patients were still alive, well, and disease-free. And if we really want to bring drugs to benefit patients much quicker, we need to have a much quicker readout. We can't be waiting until at least half of the patients who've been receiving the drug, their diseases come back, which is the way we do it at the moment. So we need to have better ways of measuring which drugs are effective so that we can get them into the clinic quicker. <laughs> 
And so that was the idea of, behind this study. So in this study, again, rather than using the bortezomib or the Velcade, the investigators um, who were, were, were mainly based in Italy were using carfilzomib or caprolis, which is a cousin, I guess, of um, bortezomib. And then they used the other CD38 um, monoclonal antibody, isotuximab. But as I say, the important thing was that all the way through the study, they measured this depth of response with a really sensitive test. And again, patients very similar between the two groups, a large study, 150 patients in each group. But the key thing was that for patients who received the four drugs, their disease reached a much um, deeper response than those patients who received the um, three drugs. And importantly, this was at the one in a million level. Um, and really very impressive that like nearly 70% of patients at the one in the million level where we weren't able to see any disease in those. Now, it was a very early abstract, so they don't have any data to show the um, how, what, how that translates into survival. But the assumption is that using this test will be a what we call a surrogate marker for survival. And actually, there's a, um, uh, a meeting coming up in springtime with the FDA and the EMA really discussing whether moving forward, we might be able to use this new test of measuring how good the responses are as a way of getting drugs available for patients quicker. Okay, so I think I just summarized that to say that it was um, a good study and can we use this moving forward? Okay. So the other, there was all sorts going on at ASH, and so I've just tried to pick out some of the good bits. If I've missed your missed anything, then we can chat about it in the questions. But the other area that was very important was around the new drugs in the bispecific antibody area and within CAR T cells. And so these are mainly at the moment for patients with relapse disease. And the kind of questions that um, the doctors are asking, I think are actually very similar to those that patients are asking. So which is the most appropriate way? Should we be using a CAR T cell? Should we be using a bispecific antibody? Or should we be using what we call an ADC antibody? So that's something like um, belantamab. Okay. Um, and if we're going to use these, which order should we be using them in? Should it, should it be a bispecific first, followed by a CAR T or an ADC? How should we determine which is the best way to use these? And then importantly, there is actually a number of different, what we call targets, different things that these drugs rec recognize. And is there a specific order that we should be using those in as well? And I think one of the key things that caused lots of discussion was how do we make these more accessible? Because I know that many patients have been hearing about them, both in Europe and the US and the rest of the world, but can't actually get their hands on it. So how are we going to um, move that one forward? And then the final bit that was that there was a lot of discussion around was, OK, we know how good the clinical trials were, but what happens in real life? Do we get the same kind of answers in real life? And so um, there was a lot of different publications around people's experience of this in um, real life. OK, and the reason this is important is that we know to get into a clinical trial, you have to meet many entry criteria. So um, you have to be ill enough to get in to receive the drug, but not so ill that um, you're, for instance, you have low blood counts or your kidney tests aren't very good or that your actual fitness isn't very good. And one of the other things is that clearly if you to go into a clinical trial, you need to live somewhere near where the clinical trial is going on. And so there's actually now an estimate about 70% of, of patients will never be able to get into a clinical trial because of a combination of those things. And so it's really important for patients, for doctors, but also for our regulatory authorities and our payers to know how these drugs kind of managed in the, in the, in the real world. And essentially what all of these studies suggested, particularly looking at um, teclistamab, which is one of the 
BCMA um, by specific antibodies was that the real world um, experience was actually very similar to that from the clinical trials, that the side effect profile was very similar. And so um, if you remember, some patients can get this unusual side effect of what we call cytokine release syndrome or CRS. Um, and that results in, um, it can result in temperatures and a drop in the blood pressure um, and um, some unusual symptoms. And But the, the incidence of that was the same as the clinical trial. It was very manageable. The only slight change was that maybe the response rate was a little bit lower. So in the clinical trials, the response rate was about 70%. But in these studies, it was somewhere between 50 and 60%. And the thought process there was actually many of the patients who were going into these kind of um, everyday practice had actually had a lot of treatment previously um, and also had a lot of other kind of medical conditions. Now, one of the kind of reasons um, that patients haven't been able to access the drug is because of a, a cost reason um, and because that the way the drug's given at the moment, be it the teclistamab or indeed any of the other um, anti um, bispecific antibodies, is that they need to be given in hospital. And that's a 10 day stay, which puts the price up a lot, but also makes it very inconvenient. And so there were a couple of publications about how people had actually been moving this from looking at patients as an inpatient to doing it as an outpatient. And essentially what, um, this is just data from the Mayo Clinic, but essentially what they were able to show was that as long as you have a good infrastructure so that patients can be looked after and go to um, their daily infusion visits, but also have um, care out of hours. So for instance, if an issue occurs at night, that they can get access to medical care quickly. As long as you could do that, there weren't any safety concerns about giving it um, as an outpatient. Some patients did still need to come in and have it as an inpatient, but they tended to only stay for two days rather than the 10 days. And importantly, patients found that it was much better than, um, than um, have coming as an inpatient. And this little graph, the idea of this little graph is it's time along the bottom. And you can see that the majority of patients were actually spending less than an hour in kind of of their treatment rather than the 10 days previously. So a win-win for um, everybody. One of the important things I wanted to talk about was about infections, okay? Because it was quite clear, and again, a lot of different studies talked about this, that even though these new treatments are incredibly successful in inducing remissions and getting the myeloma under control, they do come with a side effect and the side effect is infection. Okay, and so this was a study from around the US, um, 230 patients, and they looked at how many patients got infections. And you can actually see that 62% of patients got some infection. And sadly, some of these infections actually resulted in, in death, which is an awful thing when you think that some of these patients, actually their myeloma was doing good, but sadly they died from an infection. And so this has resulted in all of the doctors being much more aware of infections now in patients. And potentially for some patients, we now give um, a number of different um, kind of prophylaxis for infections. That could be an infusion to help bring a patient's immune system up, or could be tablets to stop them getting bacterial infections and so on and so forth. But I wanted to make everybody aware of that because I think it's so important moving forward that both patients and their doctors know of that infection risk. Okay, what about other new things? 
We've talked about CAR T cells in the past. There's a, many new different CAR T cells coming through. Um, there's some that are called armored CAR Ts where they've changed the structure of it and it's much more difficult for the body to reject it. There's lots of new targets. And so there was a number of different um, um, kind of publications talking about their experience of CAR Ts. And so I think over the next year or so, in addition to the two that we currently have available, there's going to be a number of new ones coming through. I finish my little spiel before we take questions, talking about some MGUS and some smoldering, okay, because I think there were a couple of interesting things that um, came up from there. Now, I don't know if we have any um, colleagues from um, Iceland listening, but there was um, some amazing work coming out of Iceland. So, um, as everybody knows, Iceland is a, a relatively small country and doesn't have a lot of immigration or migration. And so they have quite a kind of controlled population. And about five years ago, they undertook this incredibly innovative study where they said, OK, we screen for breast cancer. We screen for colon cancer. Why on earth do we not screen for blood cancers? And the questions that they're they, so they decided they would start screening for blood cancers. And the kind of questions they were asking was, is this a cost-effective way? Um, if we find out that a patient has a blood disease early, so let's say we find out a patient has the monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance, MGUS, and if they don't have myeloma yet, does it make a difference if we know that they've got it? Will it affect their long-term outcome? And if it does make a difference, what about the patient's kind of psychological well-being? Is it better to know that you've maybe got something that may or may not develop into a cancer? Or is it better to not know? So they actually have screened about 75,000 individuals looking for um, myeloma, smoldering and MGUS and following them over a number of years. And I just wanted to highlight two studies that um, they presented at this year's meeting. One was about patients' risk of having a thrombosis. So this could either be a, a what we call a deep vein thrombosis. So that's um, a blood clot in the leg or could be a blood clot in the lungs. And essentially what the investigators showed was that patients with monoclonal gammopathy, so MGUS, had an increased risk of getting a blood clot. They couldn't quite figure out why. They thought it might be due to the level of the protein in the blood, but that wasn't the case. And so they said that, yes, they need to do further studies, but the important no about this increased risk of blood clots so that if the patients were having an operation or were going flying somewhere, they knew about their risk and they could be proactive about either wearing flight stockings or asking the doctors for some um, blood thinning drugs. The other thing that they released this time was the study looking at what the psychological impact of knowing that you may have M um, MGUS. So as you know about for every 100 people that have MGUS, one patient may go on and get an active blood condition every year. And so that means that 99 patients, actually nothing's going to happen to them. And so they did a very clever randomized study where they let patients know what was going on or indeed they just didn't let patients, they didn't tell patients the results. And then they went on and did a number of tests to see the patient's general well-being. And the conclusions of their study was that it was very feasible to do this, that actually there was no demonstrable harm to letting patients know what was going on as long as you did it in a very detailed and balanced way. OK, and that actually this may be helpful in the long run. And so they're still collecting data. But I think one of the take home messages is so far in their studies, it's actually suggesting that maybe we should be thinking about screening patients moving forward in the idea so that we know which patients maybe have a problem and therefore we might be able to stop them 
developing full-blown myeloma. Now, the last study I wanted to talk about just briefly um, is a kind of longer similar line, which is kind of what can patients do to potentially help themselves. And um, Dr. Irvi Shah is um, an investigator who just works up the road from me, actually, in, in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And she has an interest in diet, okay, and how your diet can affect your myeloma care. Now, we know that obesity and diets that don't have a lot of plant-based factors, um, are patients who have that are at increased risk of getting in the first place. And if they do get mucus, they're at an increased risk of moving forward and developing myeloma. And so she performed a really clever study looking at whether a, flan a, a plant based diet could help and make a difference. And so patients were enrolled in a study for 12 weeks and they were actually given food. They could choose which kind of food off a menu, but they were given 12 weeks. So give um, coaching about um, uh, from dietitians about the best way to um, eat. And the aim of the, the study was to see if it was feasible and what happened to patients' quality of life. And essentially, although it was only a small study, 23 patients, um, Dr. Shah was able to show that the patient's quality of life improved, that a number of the patient's symptoms, such as shortness and breath and fatigue, improved. They lost some weight and their body mass index got better. And in some of the blood tests, they actually had a tantalizing improvement um, potentially in some of their myeloma markers. And so she's now taking this into a bigger study, really to see whether changing patients' diets could help. So I'm going to stop there. There's quite a lot of different information to take in, but I'm very happy to um, take questions and to see what people um, thought about that. So I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen, hopefully. OK, and then I can hopefully see um, Celine and team and we can um, have a chat. Thank you so much, Faith. That was a very good presentation. I learned a lot and I hope the audience learned a lot as well. Um, let's move to the question and answer session. Um, I we have a number of questions already, so I hope we'll have to we'll have time to answer them all. Um, and uh, I guess everyone um, knows well how to use the feature, so I don't need to remind uh, people about that. Um, so maybe. So I obviously have a question around AL amyloidosis, but maybe we should go like chronologically, uh, starting from the first um, the first trials you told us about. Um, so there was a question, two questions around the cost of the four drug combination <laughs> that you mentioned in the PERSEU study. So how do you think that going to that is going to look like in the European healthcare systems and if it's going to vary between different countries. Yeah, no, I and I, I, I think that is going to be one of the, the key questions, okay? Um, and it's very much a, a balance, as I think as everybody knows, that when, when we take a drug to the European regulatory authorities, we need to, to show that, it, that it's effective, but it's also cost effective. And so as part of that whole work, we need to be able to demonstrate um, that how patients' quality of life changes um, and um, how potentially the um, way we use the healthcare system changes. And so I think one of the, the questions moving forward is to some extent going to be how long do you carry or during the maintenance period. Because to some extent, um, if we, um, both from a patient's perspective, but also from a payer's perspective, nobody really wants to be on drugs for a long, long time. OK, um, and particularly as survivals are getting better, you know, the answer is, do we want to do maintenance for two years, for four years? Certainly, we don't want to be doing it for 10 years or 20 years. And so one of the nice things within that study was that actually patients in the maintenance phase 
got the um, the two drugs um, for two years. And then if they were in a very good remission, they actually dropped one of the drugs and continued on the Revlimid. So the, the hope is that by getting patients into a very deep remission and beginning to use this minimal residual disease test to identify which patients are in the best remission, we may be able to use our drugs more wisely, which will not only help patients because they won't need to be on drugs longer and have the side effects, but will also help us with the regulatory authorities. Um, but I agree, it's going to be um, uh, an interesting kind of time as everybody um, battles with these different sides of, of, of discussion. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to MPE helping us with the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, we have a second question around the perceived study. Do you, do you know why the male versus female imbalance is um, has not it is not really well preserved? Um, I think they were more males than females. Um, yeah. And do you think that ha that can have an impact on the results as well? Yeah. So. Actually, um, myeloma is more common in um, males than females. And um, I, I agree, it's maybe a little bit more in the, in, the, um, in the Perseus study. If we look in the Ischia study, there's still that imbalance. Um, and so it's probably, you know, about right. So, um, yeah, I don't have too many concerns about that. Okay, thanks. I have a question around MRD. So after one has achieved MRD negative stages, what's your recommendation around how often should one have an MRD test to confirm they continue to be MRD negative? Yeah, okay. No, really great questions. Um, and um, I think as um as many of the questions as we're discovering they're questions that patients are battling with and cons and um uh, doctors are battling with as well um so at the moment there is no set time period and certainly the IMWG and the International Myeloma Society are working around potential guidance to help with this. Um, I think at the moment most people are saying kind of six months okay um, before you would um, potentially want to change treatment but also there's discussion about actually being MRD negative for up to two years before you start stopping therapy. So there's a kind of time frame as to how often you should have the test done, but also then a, think, a thought process as how long you should be negative before you start thinking about stopping treatment. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question on that. Um, do you know if liquid biopsies or any kind of less invasive um, um, sampling um, will become a standard anytime soon? Yeah, so I can say I didn't have time to present that, but there was a lot of data um, at, um, at the meeting presented around the mass spectrometry technology. Um, and so that is a blood test um, where they can measure the patient's specific um, myeloma marker. Um, and it's um, much more, A, much more accessible for laboratories because many labs already use a mass spec for doing other things, but also from a patient's perspective is um, much easier. Um, and there was a lot of data presented to suggest that depending on the technology use, that you can actually get to very sensitive levels. The levels may not be up to that 10 to the minus six level that the, um, the current bone marrow test can get to, but it seems to be that for some of them, you can get to the 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus five. And so one of the thought processes now is that maybe um, we think about using a regular blood test to begin with. And then when that when we get it negative with the regular blood test, we can maybe change to the mass spectrometry blood test. And then when we get negative to that test, we can then change to the bone marrow um, because that would dramatically reduce the number of bone marrows that patients had. At the moment, I think we still marrow going on trying to get over that though. Okay, well, it's going in the right direction. So <laughs> we, I guess we'll hear more about those um, later 
and uh, in future meetings. I'd like to move to bi-specifics now. Um, would you say that bi-specifics are an appropriate option for frailer patients, um, given the infection rates that that they are causing and because maybe of other side effects? Yeah, so um, it's quite interesting that um, I've actually treated quite a lot of frail patients now with bi-specifics and the the tough, the initial tough bit is those first few days when you may get those this cytokine reaction, um, cytokine release syndrome problem. I, I have to admit, I most of my patients I've admitted to hospital for those first few days so that I can keep a close eye on them. Um, but I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, I think that the key thing, um, so I think patients can tolerate it. And there, in my experience, there hasn't been a particular cutoff or anything for age. I think the key thing, though, is managing um, infections and making sure that A, patients are on lots of prophylaxis and B, if a patient has a problem that they go directly to the haematologist and they don't accidentally go to their primary care doctor or their GP because their GP is probably not going to be experienced in treating that kind of level of infection and, would, and the patient would need a little bit more support. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, moving to CAR T's now, um, do you think the new CAR T cell treatments that have been presented at ASH will be more available than the previous <laughs> ones, <laughs> or not really? Yeah, no. I, I that so um, we all desperately want these to be much, much more available. Um, some of the manufacturing technologies did appear to be. Um, I don't know if easier is the right expression, but did appear to be more generalizable. And so I think um, that, that that's important. Um, I think as well, one of the other things that did happen at ASH was there were a lot of, um, I was going to say, academic centers, so the university centers presenting their experience with CAR-Ts. And so there seems to be kind of Two, two movements. One is improving the process for manufacturing, which will clearly make it more accessible. But the other is actually, rather than having a commercial enterprise, having the universities maybe doing this in the individual countries, which again would make it more accessible. So uh, there's a general recognition, quite how quick that's all going to happen. I don't know throughout the world, really, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. And regarding safety, was there um, a lot of discussion around the FDA investigation about CAR T and secondary cancers? What do you think about this issue? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So um, that kind of came out, that, that comment kind of came out around ASH. And I think one of the things, particularly for myelomas, which is a little bit difficult to unpick, if that's the right expression, is sadly we know that myeloma patients are already at risk of having a second cancer just by having myeloma. And so we, we know that, and that we know that as myeloma patients go through their treatment, often their risk of getting another cancer can actually increase as well. And um, for those that have been uh, um, involved with myeloma for a number of years, you probably remember we had a similar kind of discussion and issue about um, our image drugs. Um, and so um, we're kind of now trying to make sure that we screen patients for um, these cancers. Now, I think on pure CAR T cell side of things, it's one of those things, and this sounds slightly rude, and I'm trying to think of the correct way to say it, and I'm not doing a very good job, so hopefully I won't offend anybody, okay? But um, I think that when we're using these drugs in the relapsed refractory setting, at that point, we want to get a response. And so what we need to learn to do is to get the response and then to manage this risk and to look after patients and screen patients properly for other cancers. If we're going to move these drugs up to the first line or the second line, then we're going to have to be much more observant about these potential risks and collect much more data to really determine wh where they are, 
how frequent it is so that we can have those conversations with our patients and say, hey, this is a good treatment, but this is the risk. And then we can kind of um, manage those things. I see. Thank you. And regarding eligibility, we have a few questions and one of them is regarding the blood counts. So do what does it mean? Do all blood counts need to be good or just few of them? Um, what, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So when, um, when a patient goes into a clinical trial, um, usually the way it works is that we need to check to see whether they're anemic, whether they have um, any low white cell counts, whether they have any low platelet counts. Um, because from a safety side of things, we then need to usually check to see what their kidneys are like, because clearly when we're giving a new drug, we need to make sure that the many drugs are either cleared by the kidney or cleared by the liver. And so we need to make sure that the patient's kidneys and liver are in a reasonable state that they won't accidentally get side effects. And so those are the key kind of things that um, we're, we're looking for when we put patients into clinical trials, particularly when we don't know too much about the drug. We don't want to accidentally cause a patient any toxicity because, for instance, their kidneys weren't working very well and therefore they held on to the drug for longer than they should have done. I see. Thanks. And within the, the trials, um, is do you know if the um, ethnicity is taken into account, uh, considering that myeloma is more common in the Black community? Yeah, so this is um, a really key and important issue. And um, up till recently, it probably hasn't been taken into account. OK, um, as far as ethnicity has been concerned, yes, um, We've always had to look about um, how effective drugs are in our Asian um, patients because they clearly have a different um, um, metabolism. But there hasn't been too much work until recently in, um, in the um, black population. And so now there's a mandate from um, the, um, the different regulatory authorities to ensure that we're including um, those patients. Um, and also, dare I say it, both drug companies and, um, and investigators are are really um, trying to improve the number of patients that have um, access to these clinical trials so that they can take part. And one of the key changes in the slides at ASH this year, which was a real step forward, clearly plenty more step forwards need to be taken, but there was usually a little paragraph or a little slot to say what the ethnic um, kind of split of the patients was. And I think that's a, it's a positive step forward, but clearly we've got many more that we need to do. I see, I see. I wanted to talk about, you know, the last part of your talk focused on MGUS, um, smoldering myeloma and the screening that has been done in Iceland. Do you know if there's any improvement towards studying um, or treating high risk uh, smoldering myeloma and uh, moderate risk smoldering myeloma? Yeah, so at the moment that, um, that study hasn't looked at treatment. It's really just looked at identifying those patients. Um, there, again, at ASH, there were a number of different publications looking at treating particularly high-risk smoldering myeloma. So those patients that haven't yet developed um, crab symptoms, so um, symptoms, but are kind of on their way to it. And there was lots of different studies looking at really the myeloma therapies in that setting. So for instance, um, there was a very nice study looking at the bispecific antibodies in that setting. And I think the key here is they seem to work very well. The question is, is how long is the effect going to be? And is it better to have the treatment early or is it better to wait until the actual myeloma develops? And so those questions are still ongoing. Okay, okay. Well, thanks so much. And maybe to finish, we can address the AL amyloidosis questions. Do you have any <laughs> update to share? Yes, I'm going to say, I'm in, I, I apologize because I know there were a lot of patients um, look, uh, looking for information about amyloidosis. So I, I truly apologize that I didn't have a slide on that. So there was, there was a lot of data actually at ASH. Um, importantly, 
um, and this sounds slightly crazy, so I apologize. There was a very good educational session about amyloidosis. And the reason I say that's important is that many of my, our amyloid patients will know this. Many doctors have either never heard about it, don't suspect it, or don't know what to do. And so that educational session was fantastic and really got everybody up to speed. But there was lots of stuff about new drugs. So um, for instance, most of our drugs at the moment target the actual um, amyloid cell and stop it producing the protein. There were some updates of the two new drugs that are actually um, helping to destroy the protein once it's been um, deposited. And the, those updates were really continuing to show their efficacy. We're clearly waiting for their phase three studies on that, but those were definitely there. Um, but there was also some new data about using BCL2 inhibitors which is a tablet in amyloid. Um, some people may have heard of venetoclax, which is one of those drugs, but there's some new ones coming forward behind that. And there were two very nice abstracts showing that those drugs seem to work in amyloidosis. And then finally, there was a um, one um, looking at CAR T cells in amyloidosis. Um, and so um, I think it's as usual, it's all happening in amyloidosis. It's a little bit kind of behind the myeloma field, but many of the um, kind of experiences that we've had in myeloma are now being tested in amyloidosis. So, um, yeah. I see. Okay. And um, would you say that, um, you know, with all those new treatments or the old treatment, if remission is achieved, um, in AL amyloidosis, do we know if the treatment should continue or do we have any information <laughs> regarding Yes, this? no, <laughs> I, I so wish we had that answer. That's one that I struggle with every day, which is how long do you um, continue the therapy in amyloidosis? Um, and it's particularly important for patients with amyloidosis because often those patients have a tendency to get more side effects. And I think, again, this minimal residual disease testing is going to be very important. We know that for amyloidosis, to for patients to have the best um, outcome from therapy, we have to switch off the, um, the amyloid clone. And if we can do that to a really, really low level, that's going to um, translate into much improved survivals. So those studies are also ongoing, looking at MRD in that setting to say, hey, can we stop if the patient's MRD negative? Okay, well, thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry we can't answer more questions, but I think Faith gave us a really good overview of uh, of uh, the ASH conference. And uh, this is the end of our webinar. Um, but please don't forget if you're in the audience to answer our 30 second survey to help us improve future webinars. The link is in the chat. And uh, on behalf of the MPE and all our attendees, I would like to say really thank you, Faith, for being there with us today and for sharing your highlights of the HASH conference and to answer all our questions. And if you have any last word for the audience, please, uh, the floor is yours. No, no, my last words are that things are definitely moving in the di right direction. And I hope that I kind of not only shared some exciting updates, but also maybe some things that, you know, as a patient, you can engage with and also ask your doctor because you're your own best advocate. So please keep your doctors on their toes. Well, thanks. That's a great take home message. <laughs> thanks a lot again. And I wish everyone a very nice evening. Mm -hmm.